You can open your Bibles to Mark 15. We'll read our text together. Mark 15. Very in the very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? Don't you see how many things they are accusing you of? Jesus still made no reply and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom of the festival to release prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd came and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Pilate asked, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one that you call king of the Jews? Pilate asked, crucify him. They shouted. Why, what crime has he committed, Pilate asked. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. There's a lot of questions that Pilate asked Jesus and the crowd, the Jews, back and forth. There's a lot of questions. But all of those questions are just an, they're just a back alley. They're just a front to avert, divert the attention to what his real intention is. You can see his real intention in verse 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd. That was what motivated Pilate. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 19 and verse 12, there is some comment that is made to Pilate regarding the fact that Jesus claimed to be a king, and so that would naturally put him in a position against Caesar. In Matthew's account, in verse 24 of chapter 27, you can read that Pilate was a, he was afraid of an uprising in the city. And because of his fear of the uprising in the city, Because he is PC, he knows his place. The Caesar is in the rule. He's being the governor. 
And he has to keep a peaceful place. Otherwise, he's afraid of losing his own position, of his reputation, of the various things that might be at stake in the political realm of power. But he's motivated by this. He wanted to satisfy the crowd. At the end of the day, Pilate is neck deep in his own selfish ambition. He is eyeball to eyeball with the Son of God. And in John's account of this interaction that Tara read from a moment ago, Pilate says to Jesus, or Jesus says to, to Pilate rather, Everyone on the side of truth is going to listen to me. And you remember how Pilate answered that question. What is truth? You know why he answered what is truth? Two reasons. Number one, he didn't believe Jesus was truth. And number two, he's motivated right here. He is deeply situated. with his own passion to advance himself. At the end of this arrangement between himself and Herod, who had been in prior years an enemy to him, because they had common ground based on their dislike of Jesus, the two of them become friends. God's redemption, the arm of God's salvation, is within a conversation distance from the governor. God's plan to remedy the sin of men all the prophets, every prophetic word finds its fulfillment in the man to whom Pilate is now speaking. And he's so blind to his own ambition. that he misses the one who died to set him free. The Jews are no different. In verse 1, you see who it is that's pushing Jesus forward. It's the chief priests. It's the elders. It's the teachers of the law. It's the whole Sanhedrin. That's your focus group. They are the drum beaters. Pilate asked Jesus to respond in verse 4. Don't you see all these things? Because look at verse 3. The chief priests accused him of many things none of which were viable, none of which were evidence, none of which were based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Rather than the evidence being what compelled them. Look down to verse 10. And Pilate is even aware of their position. They are coming to Pilate. Pilate has his own 15. That's his heart. He's situated with his own disease. But the Jews have their 10 and 11. Because Pilate knows that when they have handed this man over, they have done it out of their own self-interest. There isn't a crime he's committed. 
They cannot prove him guilty of anything with respect to the law. Rather, their intention, verse 11, shows what they desire. The chief priest stirred up the crowd. That's why, look your eyes back to verse 8, that's why you see the crowd come and ask Pilate about that arrangement. Hey, do you remember normally you, you, you turn us out a guy? We got a guy in mind already. How did that get there in the crowd's mind? Because the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin are working the crowd. Because in their hearts, they are eyeball to eyeball with the Son of God. The one who came to save his own people, the Prince of Peace. They did not understand God's presentation of a lamb. They didn't picture that moment on the mountain where Abraham took his own son. They didn't imagine that moment to be a reality. within arm's reach of the one who created them. They are oblivious because of their own selfish ambition. Not to think that these crowds alone are responsible. Not to think that the religious leaders alone are responsible. Not to think that Pilate alone is responsible. Or, or as if they are out of the ordinary. Just hours before this moment... Jesus' own disciples are arguing over which one of them will be ranked number one and which of them will be ranked number two, which of them will be ranked number three. Let's get that worked out. While Jesus gets a basin of water and gets up and washes their disgusting feet in a moment of servitude. Verse 16. The end of verse 15 says, He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away into a palace called the Praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him. Purple is for royalty. It is suggestive of majesty. They twisted a crown of thorns. A crown would indicate 
someone who is in a position of authority and rule. They twisted a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff. And they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off his purple robe and put his own clothes on. They let him out to crucify him. Do you understand the picture? Oh, king of the Jews, <laughs> come on, get down here. Let's all do it. They have him dressed in a robe. The whole thing is a charade. It's a mockery. That moment that should be a moment where all those things happen to Jesus from a viewpoint of worship. That we in our minds and in our hearts would dress him in the most royal presentations. Do you know what his throne even looks like. A crown on his head is so firm, it's immovable. And it's glorious. And it suggests not just authority, but authority over the living and the dead, over the past and the present. You can't find a living king that looks like that or sounds like that. Hail, king of the Jews. Isn't that what we are saying here today? And they got on their knees. See, all those elements, man, it's just a picture of what should be happening. But because selfish ambition has taken over the lives of men, it's a power grab. That's what's happening in 15. And it leads to the result of your Lord being crucified. I appreciated so much what Terrell said this morning. You are the betrayer. You are the crowd. And we are. Selfish ambition will never ever be able to positively respond to Christ. Now let's take some application from this. Here's a picture. It's a pretty good picture. It's actually uh, each one of our private 
places in our hearts, in our minds, in our quiet time. We deal with this stuff. We deal with it up here. And sometimes we have these power grabs. We want to show out. We want to act like we are in a position to make power calls over our lives. Just like these men do, and we do that in the face of the cross. Just like these men. We leave this moment where we are staring our crucified Lord in the face, and we walk out that door and we say to ourselves, oh, well, yeah, I mean, he's got Sunday, but the rest of it normally belongs to me. Can I tell you something? When you even think that for a moment, you are as disgusting in your mind and that place as this crowd. There is nothing left if selfish ambition is dead. The only thing that follows is the living part, the living for Jesus part. Here's what he did. He died. He died to sin once for all. Romans says, and the Hebrew letter says, he died for sins once for all. That the death that he died, he died to sin. The, the life that he lives, he lives to God. Well, that's the similar place for us. Every person, including myself, in this audience looks just like Pilate. We look just like the chief priest. That's us. The whole reason Jesus Christ came was to save sick, disgusting, repulsive people like that. Because that's us. We are those people. You don't have a single, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have already died to this. Selfish ambition is done for you. You don't have a want. Show me, show me where Jesus Christ wants you, gives you the authority to make all those calls for your own life. Selfish ambition, these men were, were using power to personally benefit themselves. That's what Pilate's doing here. That's why he's PC. He wants the outcome to pat him on the back, make his town look good, and, and get him a promotion. That's what Herod does. That's what the chief priests are doing here. They don't want to ruckus. They want to put this thing away so that nothing else is further from it. They are pushing their own agenda. In the face of God's plan? How dare they? And then we have to look at ourselves and say, okay, wait, wait a minute. That kind of sounds like me. That kind of sounds like me yesterday. That kind of sounds like me last week. That kind of sounds like me last month. When I was just using the conditions of this life to benefit me and me only, and it's me about me, and it's me thinking about my retirement, it's me thinking about my marriage, it's me thinking about my kids, it's me thinking about my job. Our response to the cross should be complete, utter abandonment of myself. 
a death of me, of what I want, of what I will, of what I desire, of what I think, of what I want to be, of what makes me happy, of what I like to do with my time, of what my interests are. Who are you to have an interest? You are a king's vassal. You don't have an interest. You don't have a desire. They all lay at the foot of the cross. Because you live for a king who doesn't want to be, be one hour of your scheduled permission. You have a king that rules your life every minute of it. Every minute. The only freedom that you can find from selfish ambition is to die to that. Remember what Paul said? Looking at the cross and bracing his comment of education from the example of Jesus. He said, do Nothing. Philippians 2. Do nothing. Alex Bayes. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Those two seats are cousins. And Paul says, preacher, you don't have permission to parade your selfish ambition. It better be dead. Why? Follow the example of Christ. Who did what? Who emptied himself. Made himself nothing. Who made the king who made himself nothing. God's redemption was on the cross. And men missed it. Isn't that what Paul says in Romans chapter 8? I'm sorry, chapter 5 and verse 8. Uh, beginning in verse 6, he says, you see, at just the right time when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while you look like Pilate, while you look just like those chief priests who's so concerned with your own personal, private pleasures, what makes you happy, what makes you feel good, while you were neck deep in that, God sent redemption through Jesus Christ. Man, that is just speechless. I can't even look God in the face knowing that. How can I then present myself? How can I have selfish ambition? How can I attempt a power grab from my Lord? No, I will not. I will live humbly. I will live lowly. I will live microscopically. Because there's nothing left of Alex, or there shouldn't be. If there's something that's left of me, then Jesus is not Lord of it. If it's about me.
The cross is the way he died. He died. And Jesus Christ, while he died, did not have the exercise of any selfish ambition. He did not look to promote himself. He didn't power grab or try to. He didn't assume even that he had the right to power grab or try to. He submitted to God's will every minute of every day. See, when you look into the cross, and there's just no way you should not be able to look at this moment where the Son of God is bearing the cost. This is what the penalty for sin looks like. And selfish ambition will be the penalty men will receive. If they stay to that course, even those who claim to be Christians, will also find themselves according to that course. If that's the way they live, the cross should minimize you. You, I love you. And I don't mean any disrespect, but you're a crumb. You're a crumb in a kingdom that doesn't even belong to you. And God has elevated you and brought you into the kingdom of the son that he loves through the gospel. Acts chapter 8, we read a moment where a man responded to the gospel. Mm. because the cross happened. What are you going to leave with today? What part of you, what part of your life are you going to leave with today still saying to yourself privately, Oh, I'm still boss of that. I don't care what he says. Which part of that of your life? Your finances? Your time? Your connections on your telephone? Your relationships? Which part of that? Do you get to say, oh, well, I, I'll submit a little bit on this way. That'll make him feel good, but I'm still the boss in this way. Wherever that exists in your life, it's killing you. This is what it's doing to you. Take your hands and go like this and squeeze and cut air off. That's what it's doing to your spiritual growth. Now, the scripture says, do not quench the spirit. Don't pour water. Don't suffocate what God's trying to grow. Selfish ambition, whoo, it's the very reason why Jesus had to die. You cannot stay in it. Don't pat yourself on the back because you're proud that you really showed out and claimed your personal victory over this, and you feel like you gave somebody one of those. That's a repulsive part of you that needs to die. God is not flattered by you patting yourself on the back, by you feeling like you gave the competition one of these, or you got a snuck in the elbow, took a cheap shot. Your pride tells you, that feels good. I should act like that more often. And that's the very cause of the cross of your king. The cross should make us small. 
should make us nothing. I don't have a life. My interests need to be what God's interests are. My emphasis needs to be what he emphasizes. My instruction needs to be what he says. I should glory in what glorifies God. That's where I should be. Every second. What can you learn? Evaluate. Look within the cross. Man, it's penetrating. And if you will get close enough to its shadow. It will compel you away from yourself and away from sin and away from selfish ambition mm, into humility, into mercy, into greater faithfulness. Tonight, we're going to look at the rest of the chapter. But if you need to respond this morning to the Lord's arms stretched out, flogged, and you want to rid your life of selfish ambition, then come. Because the death of you is the only way that happens. And if there's not somebody in this group that doesn't need to die a little bit more, I would be surprised including myself. So if we can help you this morning, we want to pray for you and lift you up to God who is powerful. The remedy is in death. That's where it happened. That's where our victory comes, through Jesus and in my life.